associate to the three D angle two theory step, and then it, it's a little bit dangerous actually to associate too much meaning to try to that, uh, 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 right, relate directly to the particular branch of the three D theory mm -hmm. in plus theory. Uh, but the way, so, so in this case, it's actually easy. So uh, I said the proof about uh, sorry this parameter sigma vector multiple here. Uh, in this case, there is a u one gate theory, u one gate theory. So there is just one parameter, so that's super easy. And then there is no integral because this is not a gate theory. Now, uh, what, what about the other thing? So, uh, what about the matrix? So that's about vector matrix. Uh, in fact, that's all about the vector matrix. So, what about the color matrix? So there are three color matrix. Sorry, five color matrix. Two color matrix. Here we have Q and Q theory, and here we have X Y Z. And corresponding to that, uh, there, there is some factor of uh, two and three factors of S B, where S B is some special factor. And it, of course, it has many, many different names uh, in the literature, double sign, uh, quantum narrow, etc. Uh, but I call it a quantum narrow. Or sometimes people call it a non compact quantum narrow. And this will be a rather important function uh, in the many study means method. Some special function. And this parameter b is the same as the deformation parameter. So this is a parameter b. But this parameter b is the same as the deformation parameter here, uh, if you have. Now, uh, and then uh, I also use some notation that Q is equal to B plus B input. There is a super potential term. There is trace, uh, not trace, well, it's U1, so X, Y, Z. And the canonical normalization for the R charge is a super potential has R charge 2. So this should have R charge half. This should have R charge half. And, and then you have other parameters, like mu, theta. So these are the parameters. So what are these parameters? So these represent some char charge assignments. So in the yesterday, uh, towards the end, I uh, explained the connection. <coughs> right, I explained all the charges. So we have QQ theater and B plus B minus M. So let me try to <coughs> copy it quickly. So the gate charge, I don't like. So there's a, a U1 axial. So there was, I took it to minus one, minus two. So there's a plus one, plus one. U1 J, uh, that's plus one, minus one. So I think you might have it from yesterday. And then uh, in XYZ model, uh, there is the same one, XYZ. So minus two, uh, plus one, plus one. And then there is one minus one. And the coefficients in front uh, represent, oh sorry, well, I should write the gate charge in here too. Gate charge, but plus one, minus one, zero, zero. So for example, well, there are five examples. I, I, I won't go through all of them. But let's take this one, for example. So this one is supposed to represent Q. So what, what appears in the argument? So here, Q, if you look at this, it has charge plus one at the gate and minus one under U1A. And I have denoted the real mass parameter for this guy to be mu, to be zeta, 
And this is a uh, scalar matrix, vector matrix scalar of PC. <coughs> so for example, for this Q, it's minus one mu, which appears here, and plus one sigma. And well, I just do one more example. For, for example, this one. Here, the exit charge only uh, minus two, you are actual. So that's why you have minus two. And you can do this exercise. And for me, yourself, that really uh, uh, represents this uh, duality, including with all these uh, charge assignments. In fact, this is interesting because because suppose that you don't know nothing about physics except that somehow you know the rules uh, translating between uh, this uh, expression to uh, back to the three D equal two theory, and you find that this is uh, useful identity in some mathematical textbook, and you can you realize that this is a duality. You can say that there is some field and it's charged under such and such by leading of these uh, charges inside, and that you can reproduce more or less this duality. So if you're sufficiently familiar with all these localization techniques, you just go ahead and find this identity and then recover the duality. Now, so so the question is, what's this um, money? Right, so there, there's this beautiful identity, but why does the axis does this identity hold? Well, of course it's a mathematical identity, but it looks very average in fact. Is there a simpler way to see why this relation holds? And that's what uh, he was saying, uh, that's this uh, pentagon. So um, so let's just, let's, for, for some, some reason, let's find this, define this function, uh, ev, to be exponential pi i 2 over x squared. And then there is a coefficient, which I don't remember, 24 i pi 1 or 2, or maybe 2. Maybe I, I'm not familiar, I'm not sure about this. SPX. So I could check, but maybe. Let's, uh, sure. So let's define the function of this. And now, uh, it's the same function, but just uh, include it. But this is a constant part, which is not terribly important. I just incorporate that function. Now, this function has a remarkable property uh, known as the pentagon. So the pe what's the pentagon? So pentagon is operator identity. So EV hat is equal to EV Q hat, EV uh, P hat plus Q hat, and EV Q hat, where uh, P and Q are usual operators representing coordinate and momenta. So this is one of our two parameters. In fact, this is almost the def defining uh, relation for this uh, quantum dialogical function. And the reason I mentioned that is that actually, <coughs> so this relation, so let's call this relation F. From this relation, we can derive this relation. So derive in what sense? So this is an equation, operator equation. Perhaps this is a C number equation, so just number. Uh, so it's like a, it's actually really like a quantum mechanical exercise. So in quantum mechanics, suppose that you have some operator and satisfy something, and you want to extract a number. And what you do in quantum mechanics, literally, is that you insert a complete set. Namely, this is like coordinate momentum. So there is um, a complete set which you can set. So PB equal to uh, 1, for example, and equal to Q, for example. So you, there is a coordinate basis or a momentum basis, or you can do, do more general things. So what you can do is to start with this expression. So that's actually going to be an exercise uh, since I don't have time. So exercise to uh, check this. And by checking this, I mean, for example, so I could try to do a little bit. For example, here you have something. So let's try to insert, for example, Q, GQ. Well, maybe I should Q prime or something in order to emphasize that Q prime is different than the operator. Why not just insert this? And then this this one acting here, this one becomes a number. And, but of course, you have P plus Q, for example. So Q part becomes a number, but of course, P part still remains. So why not insert, for example, P here, P prime, P prime. And then you can act, try, try to act P on this side. And then this one becomes a number. So that way, you can convert this expression uh, to a C number expression. And the exercise is that this uh, relation, after doing that manipulation, is this relation. And this one definitely looks beautiful, uh, much more beautiful than that expression. And in fact, this is how people come up with this special function, historically. So this is really the truth of it. This is really true. So it's not 
most crucial uh, of the bus logics. But then it might argue that, well, it might mean that this relation itself <laughs> is also fundamental from the view of the supersymmetric case. But does it, does that make sense? So that's the question I'm coming to. And in fact, for example, this is an operator. So there are a lot of questions in front of this. So this is an operator. So I say that this is a partition one. So this, this is something representing a 3D game for two series. But I'm saying that I want to promote it to operator. What does it mean to a field theory to be an operator? How does the field theory act on anything? That sounds like a very a strange idea. But it, it, it turns out that it's not too strange. So what should happen is that it's 3D and for 2 theory. <coughs> so we have 3D and for 2 theory. Given the 3D and for 2 theory, there should be some operator. So let's call this schematically P, for example. There should be some operator P representing that, acting on some Hilbert space. So probably this is finite dimensional. This is some quantum in final dimension. Final dimension because, for example, this is P and Q. So they are one momentum by one point. How could this be possible? Well, the answer is that uh, this 3D and 2 theory acts, uh, could be thought of as a boundary condition or a domain wall between a higher dimensional field theory. Namely, suppose that they have a 3D and 2 theory. And then uh, I could suppose that I have 4D and 2 theory here. So this one is copy here uh, from this viewpoint, from the viewpoint of this dark theory. Uh, and then suppose that this is a domain wall, so there is another uh, 4D and 2. Well, it could be the same theory, but the parameters are different, for example. So let's uh, schematically write a set of parameters by tau, for example, tau prime, for example. Uh, it's a little bit schematic. So they, right, so this is the domain wall between 4D and 2 theory. And, and you can convince yourself that this <coughs> really acts like operator. Namely, there is a Hilbert space of the 4D theory. So this is this should be something associated with the 4D and 4D theory. But I increase the dimension because I want, uh, I cannot, right, so if you have a domain wall, that necessarily breaks some of the supersymmetry. Um, right, so, uh, because, right, so because the translation is broken, symmetry is broken, uh, if all the supercharges are preserved, you can use the supersymmetry algebra to show that uh, uh, translation symmetry is not also not broken. This is not the case. So some of the supersymmetry <coughs> should be broken. So I, I took that. So for that reason, I take a, a theory with eight supercharges as opposed to four here. Now, this indeed really acts like operator. Because in the operator, for example, you have to take a product. So what does the product mean? Well, this is some operator. And uh, there is an operator. Uh, another operator. This is O hat, O one hat, O two hat. So let's take the domain wall, for example. And and then uh, the taking the operator means that so they take a product of these operators mean that you polarize these now. Uh, so and so you you polarize these things. And then there's a single domain wall, uh, which should be representing O one O one dot O two, where this is a product of the other operator. Now Actually, there, there's a little bit more you can do. If you do this exercise, you, you probably begin to realize that there's a little bit more than that. So because I, I implicitly use some some uh, some basis when you convert this exercise to Siemens. Namely, for example, inside I could insert any uh, complete space, P basis, Q basis, etc. And inside the answer doesn't matter because we are integrating anything. So whatever basis you choose, the same is everything you want. However, when I convert this operator equation to numbers, I have to insert something here. So let's call this in space. And then call this out space. So I could take this, right, so I could take an expectation value of this in terms of P basis, for example. Uh, P and P, or Q and Q. Or you could try to <laughs> consider a mixture of P and Q. So uh, in other words, this correspondence is actually not really one to one. In other words, so if, want to, if I want to go to partition function stuff, so this is a expectation value of this operator, but with respect to some state, in space and out space. In space and out space. 
But there is an ambiguity in the choice of in and offset corresponding to this SL to Z ambiguity. And it's SL to Z because uh, because uh, because of the quantum mechanics. So it's a it's a one-dimensional quantum mechanical problem. So it's a simple, simplest uh, simplest manifold with PDP with the H the Q. But then there is another basis. You can you can apply uh, you, you can uh, apply the SL to Z transformation to obtain another basis. Well, I think I would say that uh, this is uh, this is always SL2Z. Uh, well, or in general, right, SL2Z. Or in general, I mean here, for example, right. So it's always S or SP2 and Z. Right. So here in this case, I have just one U1 symmetry. But if you have many, many multiple U1 symmetries, uh, right. Uh, well, partly part because I'm discussing abelian series. Right. So this is a standard basis, standard ambiguity in the choice of the basis. Why? Why does it have to be integer? Ah, because I want to be, I, I want to preserve the uh, simplistic form. Oh, okay. Well, in fact, I could do this SL to R. In fact, uh, in crossing R. But I have to quantize it. So there is a zero quantization condition. Yes. Okay. Right. Uh, so there is the SL2Z ambiguity. Just one thing, it's a complete Yeah, so I think, uh, right, so, okay, so, well, I mean, okay, so, so so far I haven't explained what, what this P and Q are really, so, yeah. it, 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 so far it's uh, some, oh, some secret object, so, but, 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 right, so, I mean, right, so, so, yeah, so, I, okay, so let me explain the physics, Gate theory meaning of this SL2Z. And it, 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 through, through that process, hopefully, it becomes clear why this SL2Z. So, uh, so what, what, what is this SL2Z? So, so the thing is that actually, when you take this expectation value, you have to specify these things. So, there are SL2Z ambiguities. So, the thing actually, which operator itself is uh, specified by SL2Z theory, sorry, 3 n equal 2 theory was modded out by SL2Z ambiguity. Somehow this tells us that not, not only the SF 3D series, but this 3D series modular SL2Z is not enough. But what is this SL2Z series? But, okay, so I should try to wrap up. But let's see. So let's try to explain uh, what this SL2Z is. So SL2Z is a As you know well, the SL2Z or PSL2Z here are generated by uh, two elements, S and T, or TK. And, uh, and in fact, I could try to, uh, right, so, right, so, okay. And if you have a theory with a U1 symmetry, suppose that I have a back transformation, and, and then S transformation says that I add the off-diagonal transform stuff. So let's write down only the Bosonic form. H A U and, and then make this to be dynamic graph. So that, right, so suppose that the theory originally has a U1 uh, global symmetry, so there is a background U1 gate theory. So you add the <coughs> on some time sum, and that gives rise to another theory. Or uh, you could add uh, background, uh, the chance time sum, sorry, this is one. is now transformed this. And in fact, this fits nicely with this picture because, for, for example, if you do this S transformation, in the S transformation in this case, simply says that, uh, uh, that whenever you have, a, for, for example, here, if you have a wave function in P basis, for example, going to the more coordinate basis means that you do this Fourier transformation. So this is the, uh, uh, 
this is what you do in quantum mechanics. <coughs> and you can take this uh, expression, and so it changes. So it's a, it changes the field theory, and consequently it changes also the partition factor. And in, in fact, you can verify that this transformation changes uh, the, this uh, S3 partition factor. Maybe this S transformation is like a two disk transformation. So uh, we can identify this SL2D action uh, on the 3D and equal to field. Now, so we know uh, we know how the, how this ambiguity works. So you gauge the type of symmetry. Yes, that's right. That's right. So here, here, that's right. So we have gauged right. You have lower symmetry, so you have you have mass plus. But then I gauge it. I add octal and some some and I gauge it. On top but, of the original theory. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. That's right. On top of the original. And then this one is gauged, so it becomes dynamical. But since I added that, I keep that as a new back plus two. Right, so, so this, again, is another theory, which has been um, this is coupled to back plus one. With a new type of Yes, that's right, that's right. And then that's this one, right. So in this case, I, the back plus is I'm not gauging anything. So back plus is not anything. I just add the back plus And yeah, and, and then it's an exercise to show that this is satisfying series to zero. And that's expression. <coughs> so maybe 2000 right. So so let me try to uh, finally uh, you may so use uh, five minutes to uh, to explain more of the connection to three. Yeah, yeah, sure, 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 sure. Right. So so what I explained is that so far there's nice structure, three D equal two theory, and there's an operator uh, acting on some Hilbert space. And on this side it looks like that this this is a four D equal two. So does this have a counterpart? Namely, uh, so we want to realize this computation from the compactation from six dimensions, uh, 62 comma zero six. So here is one story, and on the other side there should be a similar story. Now here we have a three-dimensional theory, so the remaining side should be uh, three-dimensional matrix. Now, given a three minus one, and correspondingly, there should be some operator. And I should act on the Hilbert space. And since this is four dimensional, this should be a two minus one. Let's call this sigma. So here, here it means that, and, and let me remind you that here, the picture was the 3D domain wall inside 4D buckets. So the counterpart, so it's, it's three, it's some bits in between four. But this three is becomes three. So there is some three minus four. <coughs> this three is replaced by M. And this four is replaced by two. Because I'm decomposing two. So, so it should be something like this. But of course, here, uh, three is dimension-wise smaller than four by one. But here it increases, so this is three, two, two. So the only thing that could happen is that uh, there is a cobalt in between. Right. So this is a three minus all these two boundaries. Now the point is that uh, there is a Hilbert space, a force field space, to <coughs> the And whenever given M, uh, it acts as an opposite. So the question is precisely what the serial space is. And, and the answer comes from uh, <coughs> working out more carefully uh, the compactation of the 60 theory, working out the topological aspects, etc. But it turns out that uh, the Hilbert space here is associated with the modular space of plus SL, SL uh, modular space of plus. In fact, uh, when Wim was more or less explaining this yesterday, except that he considered this is irregular puncture, so yeah, I consider the regular puncture. Uh, but, uh, right, so given the manifold, uh, there is a modular space of the cross And it's known that actually, uh, I don't want, 
go into any detail, but it's known that this is a finite dimensional <coughs> module. In fact, if you, if you have a third stem tree, it's likely that you already know the dimension of the module exists, for example. In this, uh, if you do this uh, quantization, etc., we know that the dimension of the module exists, uh, but I give us three, for example. It's 3d minus 3 plus h, where h is the number of functors and g is the genus, for example. And from that, we learned that uh, there are three conformal killing vectors and modular the Riemann surface. That's something we learned at the beginning of the quantum physics, so it's not just me saying. Um, so uh, this, this, it, it's, a, it's basically the same, uh, same module. And it's a finite dimensional system. <coughs> uh, and it's a symplectic manifold, it turns out, so you can quantize it. And it's a finite dimensional manifold. You, you, quantization simply gives a finite dimensional quantum mechanics. So that means that there are coordinates and momentum for So uh, there are, uh, this is a finite dimensional space. So there are PIs and QIs here. If you choose a good basis, this is really like a quantum mechanics. So this uh, complete thing. It's just really like a quantum mechanics where they have the simple commutation, canonical commutation of this. H bar. Where well, H bar is like a B square in, in, in my story. So is there any restriction on the type of real surface that you can have? Well, I mean, for most of the purposes, it's well, useful to well. consider the hyperbolic case. Maybe the like, uh, Euler character is negative. Right, that, that, that's right. So that's that's the case that I have in mind. Yeah. Well, in other words, I, I want a sufficiently many functors because this right. So if you want if you want to right. So well, for, for example, if you have just a sphere with three functors, for example, there is no module. For example, so there is this is going, there, there is nothing here. I want some module. For example, so for that purpose, I want uh, sufficient genus and sufficient many functors. And and the only, the thing I can tell you is that there is a, a way to uh, write down this Hilbert space. And um, uh, and and this right. So so how then, then but there's one thing which I haven't explained yet. So so this is a mathematical object, and uh, and but but then how, how does this operate after? In, in particular, how how does this identity <laughs> represented here on the three manifold side? So that's the thing I'm going to explain the remaining four minutes. Um, and the explanation is the following. So this is a quantum that was a quantum, uh, identity of this real function EB. And uh, uh, this name shows there is a non-parameter family B. So first of all, before understanding this, it's useful to take the classical argument and see what you obtain. And so in the classical argument, so I could reuse this expression. So in the classical argument, This EB function EB holds as exponential uh, one of B squared and Ri2 exponential x. Well, maybe 2 pi i or something, 2 pi i, something squared, please. Where this is another function known as a classical derivative function. But the, the reason I mentioned that is that so if you take this limit appropriately, uh, you obtain uh, some identity. Uh, among these uh, a i two, so this is a classical <coughs> side over. And this function plays an important role in the geometry of three manifolds because, because if you have a single tetrahedron, and suppose that this is a hyperbolic, in other words, there is a hyperbolic space a three, and there is a so-called ideal branch triangle. So you can consider a tetrahedron like this. So this is not ideal triangle. Uh, so what is this? So if you have a hyperbolic three manifold, for example, well that's a generic case, and then you can try to decompose this hyperbolic three manifold into this tetrahedron, which has this particular hyperbolic structure. And, and the point is that this volume of this guy is like Ri2. 